<laughs> okay, let's dive in. How are we doing? Let's uh, let's let's get some let's get some knowledge going. Okay. Okay, so we've got a couple of topics before our first break today. We're going to talk about basically psychology 101, basically the reason behind everything that we're doing. And what we really, really believe in is what we call the seven steps to making a sale. Um, just so you know, what we're going to be teaching here this morning applies to everything we're going to do basically for the next uh, 24 hours here. Uh, it applies to our phone call, it applies to the actual live consultation, it applies to our follow-up process. So the psychology that we're teaching is actually going to flow through everything. Um, this is based on textbook stuff. There is essentially nothing we teach that is based on us thinking we're smart. Like, you know, Ed, he went to Wake Forest, he has an international baccalaureate program, smart guy. Doesn't mean he's any good at this, necessarily. The reason he's good at this is he's good at this. Um, and everything that we do has either been tested over tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of dollars worth of sales on the practices we work with nationally, or is based on actual textbook knowledge. There's nothing we teach that doesn't have a fact behind it. I may not always have time to go through every fact, but on break, say, well, why is it that we have to build a report, which is an obvious and easy one? And I can talk to you about why, you know, which books actually say that you should do this, and then the testing and implementation and results that we've achieved. So let's talk a little bit about it. The basic seven steps to making sales. We want to build a rapport. We want to review goals and needs. We want to do a company history. We want to do features and benefits. What you don't want. Trial, close, and ask for the order. Thanks for coming, guys, and uh, have a great weekend. There's more to it. It is widely believed, and there's a lot of different versions of this. You can find someone who says it's six steps or nine steps or a slightly different amount, but fundamentally, we have this many steps. Um, uh, most of the slides, by the way, for those guys are in different seats. If you're not perfectly able to see, you've got copies of everything in your notes. You can read along and so on. Uh, so there should be, and there's a USB if you want to do it on your computer or whatever. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the whys. Fundamentally, I mean, something I'm not going to teach you today because you already know is you fundamentally want to have a nice rapport built, right? Yes. The question is why? <laughs> We need to connect, uh, or good relationships. So the reality is a lot of these things are sort of nebulous as to why. What we want to actually teach you is the actual deep-rooted knowledge of why the human heart or the human mind actually needs these things. And then you can build rapport as you see fit. So let's talk a little bit about it, the psychology. Building rapport, will people buy from you just because they like you? Who says no? Who says yes? Here are the statistics. The answer is, depends on the price of what it is. <laughs> the actual answer, let me give you an example. Girl Scout cookies. The kid comes up to your door, knock, knock, knock. Hi. <laughs> Hello. Hi. <laughs> what can I do? Cookie. Okay. How much is it? Who likes Thin Mints? Yeah. Four bucks? Four bucks. What are you going to do? You're going to buy a box of cookies. You might buy a hundred because you've got four bucks and you like her. Is she a good salesperson? Well, it's up for kind of yes, right? She's the cuteness alone. Um, now, let's say she walks up and she goes, hi, Ferrari, million dollars. <laughs> Most people in this room, few of you guys maybe are more successful docs, but more often than not, the answer would be no. In general, assuming something isn't a pity purchase, which sounds negative, but it is fundamentally what you know, your kids' charity drives can be. You buy the little magazine subscription and they get a little thing. It's something you're purchasing as a courtesy. You wouldn't go out and buy normally. You don't show interest in regularly. Unless it's in that range, in general, people will not purchase from you just because they like you. Will they not buy from you if they don't like you? This is 100% yes. And this is why, of course, the receptionist way of answering the phone, you know, your particular you know, attitude when you meet with the patient is important. So important to understand that what we're really trying to do, and this may be the first thing worth taking a note on, is what we're trying to do in order to make a sale is to build the value to greater than the perceived price. In order to make a sale to the patient, whether it's a simple laser treatment or a Botox or braces or you know, a breast augmentation or whatever it is, 
uh, for them to sell us this room, we have to believe what we're getting is higher than what they're asking us to pay, or at least even to have a chance. So, for example, who here would say that their prices in their market are on the you know above middle, meaning are somewhere in the high to high high range? Maybe. 60, 70 percent, 80 percent. Would anybody say they're they are you know not in a negative way, but are, are very cheap for their area, like low, low price, you know, kind of a volume. You're a little lower. Anybody else? So the vast majority of people here are priced you know, middle to high for their area. So people aren't going to buy just because they like you. And what we have to do is figure out the psychology and grow the perceived value of something. Now, um, everybody has vices. We kind of talked about them in hobbies. Hobbies actually become are kind of like your vice. Uh, some of you, I like fancy watches. I spend too much on a nice watch. I don't know why, I just do it. It's dumb. Uh, my wife buys Louis Vuitton shoes. These are, they have a red back and they're four times the price. I don't know, they seem nice. I mean, they're beautiful, but they're more. Uh, some people buy plastic surgery. Other people buy you know, nice frames on their spectacles uh, for their face. Everybody has little vices. I don't, so I don't do any of that. You go out to a $200 steak dinner or whatever it is. Everybody has something that they enjoy spending their money on. And to the, for those things, you value them. Um, and when they give you the price, you believe you're getting more than what you're paying or you wouldn't spend it. What we're trying to do with our patients is help them to understand our price. So for example, let's say someone's researched you. They've called your office. You say there's a great deal going on. It's free. What do you want? I would sense that if they're calling your office, you probably have almost a 100% close ratio. Almost every, because they'd say, well, yeah, he's worth at least X thousand, and he's asking zero. So the value is way more than the price. <laughs> now, bear in mind, there are things you wouldn't pay for. You know that statement? That's a very low value product for you. So I've had tickets to a Marlins game here in Miami, for those guys who don't like baseball. Uh, I've had knows with you know, face value is $30. I will pay you $10 to go to this game. I don't want them. I don't have the time. I'd rather watch it in HD or not watch the game at all. So to me, the value of a Marlins team, you know, Marlins ticket, because their owner is terrible and they stink at baseball, um, is worth less than zero right now. That may change if they become champions again. So what we're trying to do the entire rest of this meeting is to help figure out how we can create a perceived value that is consistently higher than what you're charging, and ideally way higher than you're charging. There are great businesses out there that do this extremely well. Um, uh, who here is into like any ladies, uh, I guess we're guys, into like nice handbags? Who are ladies? Does anybody want to say like what's one fancy brand you like over the others? Right. What? Right, what do you like? Valentino. Valentino. Anybody else like a special brand? <clears throat> Louis Vuitton. So we, we all have our different brands that, that we like, and, and they're all probably selling you know, hundreds and hundreds of dollars, if not thousands of dollars, for a nice bag. And it's something that you decide to spend your hard and money on when, when you can get away with it. Now, the question is when someone says the word Louis Vuitton, because I mean, everybody knows that name. Um, they own everything in the world. Louis Vuitton, no way, and so they're having a bad year, by the way. <clears throat> Look up the article. Um, people want less branded items. But with, with Louis Vuitton, why is it that they're worth more? Why is it that a bag's a thousand? They don't discount. Does that make you think it's worth more? So you value the fact that they don't discount. What else? Why are they even able to not discount? There's an emotional pride in ownership. Emotional pride, they don't discount. Quality. What do you guys think about the quality? Is it better? I don't know. I, I don't own a Louis Vuitton bag. It is better. Okay, it's a better quality. Branding. Branding. Perceived value. Perceived value. Well, the reality is, wouldn't you agree that it isn't worth it to a lot of people? Does anyone know someone who the last thing on earth they'd ever do is buy a Valentino bag? Sure. The answer is it's, it's worth it to you. It's worth it to you, and it's worth it to you, but it's not worth it to you. You're shaking your head. That's crazy. Um, so what's happened is with certain individuals, they've succeeded at building the perceived value in the mind of that individual. Now in terms of the quality, one of the things you'll notice is it is a better quality. Lon mentioned, I do think that a really nice, well-made Louis Vuitton bag is probably more nicely made than the knockoff at the flea market. Whether or not it's a thousand times nicer, even though it's a thousand times more money, I don't know. You know that may not be true. So what we're trying to do throughout the, the, this process is build the value. So. Let's talk, let's pick a procedure to use for the morning. Do we want to use rhinoplasty, plastic surgery, braces? What do we want to pick? 
Rhinoplasty. Rhinoplasty. Okay. We're giving a rhino. We're selling a rhino. It doesn't matter what it is. We're selling a widget. Rhinoplasty is what we want to sell this morning to our client. Well, what is the average going rate? For those of you guys who are above the average market, what's your average price in your market for a rhinoplasty? All in. You pay for the sedation and the OR and all that. Fourteen thousand. Fourteen thousand. That's probably a New York price. Nine thousand. That's a California price. Six thousand. That's an Urbana Champagne, Illinois price. Seventy-five hundred. Seventy-five hundred. Let's pick something in the middle. It's called eight grand. So that's in the middle of all those. Now, bear in mind, some people when they said fourteen grand, you see the room. Yeah. <laughs> you guys sell this stuff. You better not do that in your next consultation. <laughs> um, I know in our main practice we were five thousand when I started. We're now ten thousand, and we sell the same amount of them, which is a separate issue. So regardless of the price, let's forget about it, because what you guys have to do, New Yorkers, is you have to build the perceived value of everybody else in this room. You've got a tough job ahead of you. Luckily, everybody's got money up there. That's at least a perception that we have about the value of New York. <laughs> true or not true, who knows? So let's build some perceived value. So let's say the person comes in and they expect an average price. They say a rhinoplasty nationally is 8000 including everything. So they've done a little research on you. They wouldn't be calling your office if they didn't at least like what they saw. Maybe they don't love you. They're probably picking two or three different doctors they're considering. They said, ah, Dr. Russo seems like a pretty good guy online, good educational background. He has a few before and after photos. He has some nice testimonials and so on. What did that just do, your website? Scream it out loud. I can't hear anybody. So what are we talking about this whole morning? We're just going to see it. The website alone, without you ever picking up, without, without doing anything, built some perceived value, right? So maybe they say, well, you know, average around here, our firm's around eight. This Ron Russo guy seems to be a little bit stronger education-wise than some of the others. He's been around, you know, 20 years or whatever, so he's probably a little more. I bet he's going to be more like 8,300, 8,500. So your website alone, which is not what we're here to talk about, if it's really well done, can build the value. You're probably not going to double it. But it's the reason they're calling, so they must think you're, does anybody think they're going to go to a below average doctor for their, the person who's going to cut their face open? Yeah, yeah I really want someone to just cut my breasts open, stick a bag in there. Who's below average? <laughs> Not going to happen. You know, I don't really care about my teeth and what happens with needles in my mouth. Who's cheap? Doesn't happen. Even the people who spend a low amount, that's the key concept, even the people who spend a low amount still think that they're picking someone who's above average. They never would have someone cut their body open who they don't think is better than average. They just thought they got a deal. They got offered a standby date or whatever. So we built the value a little bit with the website. You built the value with your educational background. That's why it's nice to work with a good doctor with a good background. But at that point, that's it. If you give them a price over 8300 which might be the exact same price as the two other people they're seeing who they also like, well, we might lose that sale at least two-thirds of the time. So let's start building perceived value. When we build rapport, can you see how, and I'm not going to talk a lot about exactly what to say, but how about being nice over the phone, having your receptionist be positive, how about having someone articulate and of high quality, someone with sophistication taking that initial call, not the receptionist once it's transferred. When we have those things happen, if they're impressed with their phone call, what does their perceived value of the procedure do? So, wow, you know, not only were they very educational over the phone, but that young lady, you know, was very, very sharp. You know, it seems like they run a tight ship over there. I bet they're a little bit more than these other two I'm seeing. And that's what we want. We want them to expect a higher price. A very key concept. Having a high expectation of price is good. You want them to be freaked out by the price that it might be, not the price that it is. If you've ever bought something and you thought it would be 10 grand and it turned out only to be seven, you're happy. Even if, even if that's way more than the average, you've got to raise their expectation of price. The fear is with most doctors, and most, and it all trickles down from the doctor, all of your successes are yours and all the failures of your team are yours. The fear of throwing a number out that's high makes you think you're going to lose them, when really that high expectation creates a pleasant surprise when the price is maybe not quite that much, if you do a good job of building that perceived value over the entire course of what we're doing. So by building rapport over the phone, live, and so on, we're going to review their goals and needs, whether it's live or whether it's over the phone. Talk a little about what your goals are. What are you hoping the doctor can do for you? How does that build a perceived value? Correct. I think that's perfect. Trish said, we're, we're personalizing our sale 
to the client. Do you guys want to feel heard? Wait, don't answer. Don't answer. Do you guys want to feel heard? Wait, don't answer. Do you guys want to, want to feel heard? Wait, don't, don't talk. Don't talk. I'm joking. It's still annoying. Everybody wants to feel heard. I learned this from my wife as well. Shut up and just listen, right? And just sometimes I just want to get it out, just listen to my bad day. She a, she's a lawyer, she had a bad court case yesterday, and something blew up in her face. And I'm like, you know what you could do? She's like, I do, and I don't really want to hear that from you. I just <laughs> want to tell you. She's like, are you a lawyer? I'm like, no, I'm not. She's like, then, you know, I'll tell you, and then you get the idea. So what we do want to do is people, A, want to feel heard. It shows professionalism. It shows additional rapport building. It, uh, it does... It, it, and most importantly, it educates you so that you can tailor your call and your consultation and everything you as the doctor and you as the ancillary staff member does during it. If they say, for example, you know, I'm a college kid and my number one goal more than anything is I've got to do this over holiday break because I can't let anybody know. Well, do we have some new knowledge? Not only can we make them feel heard by just regurgitating that and helping them feel comfortable with it, but we then have some knowledge on how to tailor that phone call. To not just say, you know what, your good news is we have an opening still in December for you, but by the way, let me walk you through some healing and let me help you to feel comfortable with your healing time and why you're not gonna have to worry about it. So we review goals and needs. Um, obviously it just goes without saying, if you don't know what they want, you certainly can't help them. We're gonna talk a little about company history. Company history is another way of saying building up the practice and the doctor's accolades. When you, when you tell people how great the physician is, how great the practice is, that you believe in it personally, and then back it up with actual bullet points and facts, what are we doing for that patient in their mind? The answer is we're going to get consistent here. Building value. We're building a perceived value, right? We're building perceived value. So they say, well, you know, I read online he was great. This girl seems great that I'm talking to. They seem very sophisticated. They're listening to me and they know my goals. I wonder if that's really all true or if I just, you know, I read on Real Self something and who knows, Real Self's got a thousand doctors, I don't really know. It's Beverly Hills, there's 10 million people to pick from. Who do I pick? Well, we say, you know what's great is that Dr. Epstein himself has actually been around for 20 years. He's performed over 12,000 surgeries. He's triple board certified, which is basically unheard of. He is a facial plastic surgery specialist. He does four rhinoplasties a week, around 200 to 250 per year. He's one of the most selected doctors in the entire world. That's not really the reason to pick him, just because he was a GQ and W and L and S and so on, that is social drive. Those are also not, those aren't the reasons to pick him either. The real reason to select this doctor is because of the results. We have over 5,000 photos online, we have 400 YouTube videos, we have over 1,000 patient testimonials, and it's all of this knowledge that really is the reason we hope you pick us. And obviously, I personally believe in this doctor, and I think once you meet him, you're really going to love Dr. White. When you, when you give honest information, even by phone, what do people think you are if you are honest? Honest. What is one of the biggest concerns people have when they're considering buying something, especially something that's deeply personal, like having their body cut open and blood gush out? <laughs> a lot of trust, a lot of ethics, a lot of honesty. You know, they're looking to spend a lot of money. Not everybody, one of our clients is wealthy. And even the ones who are, don't want to waste it. I don't know a lot of dumb. There's a few dumb rich people, but most of them are pretty smart. That's how they got there. So we're building trust and honesty. Could you imagine in your role with the knowledge you have going in for a tooth implant and you need one, you go to a buddy and you know, he says, yeah, yeah, there's no real recovery time, it's easy. You'd say, well, I read online that there's recovery. Why is he saying there's none? Am I wrong or is he dishonest? First, if you just say it and they already know it, you're building honesty and when they feel trust, what happens to their perceived value? We just jumped it. We talk to them a little bit about what they don't want. We educate them in a non-scary way. We don't say, Maria, your life will be ruined if you pick this other doctor or look at this horrible result. But if we actually explain to them some of the pitfalls other patients have made and some of the concerns and education points that they should research before committing to you or anyone else, we say, you know, Dr. Patanis obviously enjoys a great reputation. Um, you know, I would like to show you some examples of some things that we try to avoid here. Not so much to scare you, um, but just to show you so you can understand what we do do right. I want to show you kind of what we don't do wrong. Um, why does that educational process help build the perceived value? The expected price. It's kind of the same as last one. Right, more honesty, right? More trust, more ethics in business. 
Um, and also, education. We're educating the patient, right? Because a lot of times, they, if you have the patient, especially the ones who are 100% sure they know everything, hi, I just want an appointment. I already know everything about the doctor. I mean, I'm very well educated, so you can just go ahead and get me on the schedule. Those people know nothing, right? They, they're like, oh my gosh, you don't even know it's a surgery, right? <laughs> so, if, especially with those patients, you know, we've really got to educate them. And a lot of the reason that you know what you do want is to understand what you don't want. The reason I know what a good car is is because my first one had 160,000 miles on it. And it, the tire would pop, and the bread. At one time, just the brake stopped. You know, if you if you ever live without brakes, you realize why you want brakes. It's a funny thing. You never you always worry about brakes the rest of your life. So we want to know we don't want. Then we do a trial close, and then we either have to meet with the doctor and ask for the order, or just go straight to the, with the, ask for the order. But trial close is a feeling out of the patient's expectations, and we'll talk a lot about the trial close later. But at this point, is their perceived value high? If we did our job well, right? They love the website, they love the receptionist, they love the person they were transferred to, the patient advisor. They love that conversation. They love the consultation. They've got a warm rapport. They've got um, a very good understanding that we understand what they want. They're very well educated on the procedure. They feel you're extremely honest with great ethics and integrity. They know what they don't want and they know what you're gonna do and they know why those outcomes are gonna be fantastic so we built up the doctor. At that point, when we do a trial close and basically kind of feel things out and say, so great, you know, based on everything you've heard, and, you know, assuming you like Dr. Landman, you know, I assume that you're still looking for kind of December, like you said over the phone. Yeah, I'm still looking for December. And assuming, you know, again, prices that kind of gave you a broad range, you know, give a broad range of price, so I'll tell you six to 10,000, a lot of them around eight. Oh, great. If they say at that point, yeah, you know, I'm still thinking about December, what have they just admitted to us? They've given us a time frame, what else? They're ready to buy. And what they've really admitted, which is the whole topic that we're talking about in terms of psychology, is that they've admitted that their, their, their perception of value is now greater than the price we're charging. So they're like, I'm there. Yeah, no, I actually, I, they're basically saying, yeah, I thought it'd be a little more. So yeah, assuming it's still in that 8K range, after I meet the doctor, he doesn't punch me in the face. Yeah, you know, this is great because you, know, you guys are really impressive. I think I want you. I just you know, want to meet the doctor to confirm. What happens is the last step to making the sale, which is in every textbook in the history of the world, is you have to AFTO ask for the order. You've got to ask for the order. doesn't matter how you ask for the order, you got to ask for the order. What's great is the asking for the order itself, as we'll talk about in a lot more detail later in Dan's talk, is, you know, it shouldn't be the hard part because you should know whether they're buying or not. So, okay, so let's stop there. Questions about the basic concept. So there's seven steps, but there's one idea, which is raise the perception of value, 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 over and over and over and over. There's a lot of little details on how we'll talk about it. For example, the value building phrase. It costs more, but it's worth it because. Ever heard this phrase? It costs more, but it's worth it because. If you just say that, it's a value building phrase. Um, you know, in Vieques Island in Puerto Rico, Dan, um, you know, the W is the most expensive hotel. And it costs a little more, but it's worth it because it has running water and nothing else in the island does. <laughs> you just built the value. Okay, I'm, I'm willing to spend, so spend $89 a night. I think I'll spend $2.99 a night, right? It, you know, the perception of value jumps. So it's a value difference. So we're going to talk a lot about detailed ways to do this later, but the psychology is build, 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 build. Does anybody have like a weird, I mean, let's talk a little about hobbies. Does anybody have like a weird hobby, like something they're into? Strange. Want to admit? You don't have to say that. Like, <laughs> hey, collapsible transportation. Yeah, yeah, no, this is true. Yeah, Ed, lo Ed loves collapsible transportation. He's got like a bike that folds up. He lives right here in South Beach, just south of here. He folds up his bike and then he, like, he's like, you know, walk around Lincoln. And then he, when he wants to go home, he just, he's on his bike again. Uh, his dream, he sent me an email one day. And the email was basically a collapsible, what was it, like a watercraft that could be built in 60 seconds? Yeah, the boat, I think. I'm never getting in a boat that could be built in 60 seconds. I'm going to sink. So, how do they ever sell that stuff? They got a bit, if you find Ed, first one, they got a perception of value in it. And one of the things they did with that boat is they had a YouTube video of guys making it in 60 seconds. One, two, three, four. At the end, I was like, oh, I can see how this is probably over a grand. 
<laughs> so what we're trying to do with everything we do, you know, and every brand that's out there, it's what branding does, it's what marketing does, it's what sales, it's what sales does, is building that perception of value. Uh, for example, how much is a cup of coffee? Yes. Two dollars. Five dollars. Five dollars. Depends if you're in the fountain blue, right? <laughs> now again, they raise your perception of value. They're like, you don't have to buy here. It costs a little more, but it's worth it because the nearest coffee around here is under a mile and a half long. <laughs> you know? Or you can take a taxi for seven dollars to get your one dollar coffee. So you they are very good at forcing a perceived value to rise. It'd be nice if we could do that, but we don't let you out of here, so you won't. Uh, so Everywhere you go, think about how they're raising the perceived value. Um, our dinner tonight, Gotham steak. The word Gotham, it's at the fountain blue. It's double aged prime, dry aged prime DSDA <laughs> organic, right? It's Kobe. Did they, did they brand that one? It's Kobe. I envision, you know, people massaging the calf, right? <laughs> How much is the steak worth? Well, we're going to find out tonight. So it's all perceived value. And not that everyone's going to buy in, but what's great about this, the one thing we talked about at the beginning is only some people in here would buy a Louis Vuitton bag. Only some people in here would buy uh, Ferragamo shoes or Gucci shoes or whatever. Only some people in here would spend $100 on a haircut. What's great is our clients self-select. They're calling your office because they're the type of person who will buy what you're selling. They're like, hi, I want this done for me or my kid or my wife or my husband or myself. So all you have to do is build the perceived value to be better than the competition in your area. And you're going to get a sale every time because they don't want the cheap guy. Now we've got a, Miami's wonderful. Uh, as much as you guys all like it, we have the best plastic surgeons here and the worst plastic surgeons here. It is freaky. You guys want to drive down US 1 and go into any strip mall, there is a plastic surgeon there. It is extremely, extremely scary. And, you know, we are famous. Every time there's that weird news article, it's us. You know, someone injected cement into a girl's butt. That was here. That was definitely here. Uh, someone recently died. I got, that's terrible to even talk about. Someone died down in Coconut Grove. That was here. Um, and, you know, yes, there's 29.95 breast augmentation in this town. Um, even though the going rate's seven grand, eight grand for, for a breast dog. But. The, those people, when they pick the twenty nine ninety five breast dog, it's because they either didn't call you first or they're not educated. It's not that they thought they wanted a cheap deal. It's that they didn't respect and understand that no one took the time to save their life and say, I don't think you really get it because I know you care about what's inside your body not spilling out and you die. I know you care about it coming out looking natural. I know you do, so you just must not be educated because I know you'd never pick a bad doctor if you knew someone was a bad doctor. So our job is to save lives. Now, I give a lot of very particular, you know, I know when I say the blood and gut stuff, you'd be like, Ugh. The reason I do it is because you guys have to be, I you know, IASM, I am sold myself. You have to be sold yourself. And the reality is we sometimes forget because we're so good at sort of presenting things. You know, sort of, you know, this is, this is the procedure. There's a very fine line incision that's going to result in a nearly undetectable fine line incision. And it's a scar, but you don't believe it. We're so good at that that we forget that at the end of the day, these people are undergoing a lot. You know, have you ever thought about what braces are? That's tough. You know, four years of you know, having two teeth implants, having a, a maxilla or oculofacial plastic surgery on or near your eye. You know, these are very particular, you know, potentially, although not likely, dangerous procedures where people are making incisions on your body and to my knowledge, you only get one. Um, depending on which religion ends up being exactly right. But to our knowledge, we might as well keep the one we got. So, you know, you got to respect that from the patient and also respect your role that, you know, you're working with good doctors or you are a good doctor and you're saving their life. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit more about it. Um, this applies, as we mentioned, to every step of the sales process, the initial phone call, the live consultation, and to the long-term follow-up. Um, okay. The seven steps to making a sale. We're going to do a quick review.